morning is coming from Matthew. We're going to actually be looking at the entire uh, chapter 18 of Matthew, but I'm only going to be reading from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. So if you have the scriptures with you, please feel free to turn with me, otherwise it will be up on the screen. And we'll be looking at uh, all of Matthew 18, but reading from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slave. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe me. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what, he had, what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for God. I haven't told this story in a long time, and there's a lot of faces, so I'll tell it again anyway. Uh, when I was in seminary, uh, we had this one professor that used to say, uh, when we do something like, you know, say something like that, she's, we'd read this text, and, and, and she'd say, you know, the word got the people of God, and, and we'd say, thanks be to God, amen. And, and, but when it was a hard text like this, uh, she would say, well, if you can't say amen, at least say ouch. So, uh, so this is one of those ouch texts, perhaps, uh, in, in some sense of it. The sermon title is uh, Living the Vida Comunidad. Um, who can translate that for me? Life. Uh, thank you. Li living, yeah, living the community life. Very good. And, and with, your, with your Portuguese, you were able to get to my Spanish. Yeah, yeah. So that works out. Um, Remember the song back in 1999 uh, called Living the Vida Loca? Yes. Yeah. Living the Vida Loca. Uh, <laughs> as I read chapter 18, it, it, it seemed clear to me that what, Jesus, what, what Matthew is doing is, is taking us through some of Jesus' teaching in order to show the community, the Christian community, what it meant to live a community life. What it meant to be drawn out of the Vida Loca, what's that? The crazy life, the life of the world. What it meant to be drawn out of that life and into the life to which God has called us as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ in the community of the church. And so we're going to kind of explore chapter 18 a little bit. Uh, we'll get to the verses that I read eventually, but I want to back up to, uh, to the uh, first part of the, of the uh, chapter and, and, and talk a little bit around that as, as we go along. But I think we can safely say that the voices that come out of the gospel are calling us away from a life in the world and the conditions of the world and, and what the world might call important into a different way of life. Uh, in 1 Peter, which is not part of the gospels, obviously, it's, a, it's an epistle, it's a letter that Peter wrote. Uh, he says in, in the 8th verse of the 2nd uh, chapter, I believe, uh, they stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, 
in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. If we go back to that first, chap first verse in chapter 18, we see that these lessons began because of the questions the disciples brought to Jesus. Basically, it says this, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus took a child and called the, called the child to him and put him in the middle of the disciples, and he said, unless you humble yourselves like one of these children, you won't even enter the kingdom. So he begins to talk about the humility of a child, a child who has no power, no authority, uh, no ownership, can't do anything for them and, until they become something like that, fully dependent upon God. They cannot even enter the kingdom of God. So he took the question and, and just said, you know, it's not about power, it's not about greatness as the world understands it. He then kind of changes the language. Uh, as he begins to talk about this, and he begins to talk about still little ones, but it's clear in the text that he's no longer talking about children. He's talking about young Christians, people new to the faith, little ones who believe, he says, the ones, little ones who believe in him. And he warns the disciples that they must be careful not to cause an immature Christian to stumble. Those who are new in the faith, they must take care of. Those who mature in their faith must live in, a community, live in the community in such a way that they help those who are new to the faith grow to maturity. Now, we're going to have a, an adult baptism this morning. Uh, Miranda's being baptized. And in that baptism, do you recall what part the congregation plays? Who can tell me? What, what do you do? You pray for them. You, you are called to, to help them grow in their faith, to help the new Christians grow in their faith. You make promises in that service of standing alongside of those who are just entering into the body of Christ and helping them mature in their faith. That's part of what's going on here. Jesus is, is talking to the disciples and he's saying to them, that they are to, to be very careful about not letting the new Christian fall and, 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 and to become lost and to leave the community. Jesus, at, at that point in Matthew's scripture, uh, Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep. It's a view slightly different than in the Markin text, but he uses it to reinforce what he just taught them, showing the importance of the young Christian to God the Father. When we move to verse 15, Jesus starts talking about the one, what uh, talking about what one should do if a member of the community of Christians sins against another one in the community. We often talk about Matthew 18, 15 as the beginning of the uh, teachings on church discipline. And in a sense, it, it is church discipline. That, that really is what it is in a sense, but it's church discipline. It's not the discipline of the world. As with other things, the church does it differently. What the church is focused on is restoration. The church is focused on restoring the one who sinned. It's not retributive justice, retribution against one who has hurt you, but it is how do we restore one back into the body of Christ. It, basically, it says if one sins against you, you are to seek that one out. Now, that's kind of different in some senses. We use if somebody hurts us, we expect them to come to us and, and ask for forgiveness and seek us out. But Jesus says, if one sins against you, seek them out and, and talk to them and try and work it out. These are my words, I'm not quoting scripture now. And try and work it out. And, and if you can do that, then, then praise God, they've been recovered. They're back in community. They're back in fellowship. They're, they're living the, the community life. But if it doesn't work, then take two or three others from the, from the church and, and, and talk with them so that there are two or three witnesses so that you can confirm what's going on and, and, and you can speak as the voice of the church, if you will. 
And if that doesn't work, then bring them to the church. Have the church speak as one voice to reinforce what, what had happened, what had gone wrong, and their need to be reconciled and come back into the body. It's only if that fails that they are to be set outside the church. The scripture says treated as, as, as Gentiles and tax collectors, which basically in, in the language of, of the day meant to, to uh, put them outside or have any contact with them. But even then, there's the sense that them being placed outside the church will cause them to really see what is wrong and change and repent and seek reconciliation to come back into fellowship with the body, with the body of Christ. You see, the world has limits in its forgiveness. The world has limits in what it will put up with it in, in, in seeking to restore restoration. But the community of Christ has unending grace. There are no limits. And so we get to Peter, the text for this morning that was read. So Peter, after hearing about this, this church discipline, if you will, this, this method of, of trying to restore the one who has sinned against you to back into fellowship, and, and, and he says this, well, how often should we forgive? How often should I forgive somebody who sins against me? Seven times? Now, he's, he's being generous because in Old Testament law, the third is like with uh, us, three strikes and you're out kind of thing. Uh, the third strike was, was, was when you went into retribution, if you will. Uh, so he's being generous with this seven times. And, but Jesus says, not seven times. And then this next, the Greek words in this next uh, sentence can, can be translated either one of two ways. And either one's legitimate. Either 77 times or seven times 70. So it's either 77 or 490 times. But it's not the point of the number. Don't, don't get caught up in the exact number because the whole point is it, it, it's huge. It's a lot. It's more, it's, it's more than you would want to keep record of. And in fact, if you're, you're thinking, okay, 77, well, if I made little hash marks every time this person did something against me and I forgave them, then when I get to 77, I, I, I can stop forgiving them finally. Well, then you missed the point. That, that's not the point. And besides, it's probably 400. But anyway, uh, the point is, it, it's a lot. It's huge. It's more than you would keep record. It's outrageous. You see, living in the Vina Comunidad means living a life of forgiveness. It means living a life of grace. And Jesus drives this point home with, with an outrageous parable of forgiveness. Uh, uh, just a, a, a parable that had to be shocking. For those who are listening, and those who he's speaking to are the disciples. He's talking to the body of Christ. He says this, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. So right after he says, not seven times, but 77 times, or seven times 70, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Now the king represents God in this parable and the settling of financial accounts with his servants. The servants, of course, represent the body of Christ, the community, the Christian community who make up the church. To understand just how outrageous and shocking the story is, you have to understand the kinds of numbers we're dealing with here. Uh, the denomination of money he was talking about was a talent. Now a talent was the largest piece of money that you could have. That was the largest denomination made. Now, I will show my ignorance in not knowing what the largest denomination in the United States currency is because I have no idea. I've never seen it. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Anybody know? $100. It's a $100 bill? Wow. It's a $1,000. There's a $1,000 bill? Yes. I've never seen one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea they made one of those. Yeah, one time they made a $10,000. They don't make it. Our, our I okay. thought that was well, well, this, this, this talent it was the largest denomination that there was in those days. So it was, the, the, was 20.4 kilograms of silver, and it was equivalent to, to over 15 years of a manual laborer's pay. 
15 years, kind of like that thousand dollar bill. No, no, <laughs> 15 years of, of, of pay. Incredible amount of, of money in those days. And then the numbers that it used, remember it was 10,000 talents. Well, 10,000 was the largest written number available. They, they didn't have any other written number that was larger than 10,000. There was no other way to say a bigger number. So Jesus takes the largest amount of money possible in a single, single amount of money with the largest number that can be expressed and combines them together. It's intended to be outrageous. It's intended to be shocking. It's more debt than anybody could pay in multiple lifetimes. There was no way that this person could repay the debt that was owed. The annual tax income for all of Herod the Great's territories was only 900 talents a year. 10,000 talents, yo. It's kind of like what we owe God. There's no way for us to pay the debt that we owe to Him. Except for the fact that Jesus freely gave Himself for us that we might be restored back to community with God, back in relationship with God. That is the point, if you will. But the disciples are shocked. The king freely forgives this debt, this amazing amount of money. The, the, the servant begs for forgiveness, asks for more time, knowing in his heart the king knew this too. There's no way he can ever pay this debt. The king priest of the dead. He takes the dead away. But that's not the last shock that comes in the parable because Jesus goes on and he says that that same servant whose debt was completely wiped out, as he's going out, he runs into a fellow servant, a colleague, a, a, a buddy who works alongside of him, who owes him Denarii, that's what it was. I knew it was a hundred something. Only <laughs> yeah. about a hundred denarii, which, which is equal to about a hundred days' wages. It's about one six hundred thousandth of what the first servant owed the king. He comes upon this man, it's a significant amount, it's a hundred days' wages. It's not, it's not nothing. I always tell Sean don't talk like that, I'm sorry. And, but it, it's, 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 it's a significant, it is something, it's a significant amount of money. But it's a lot less than what had been forgiven this one servant. And the other servant says, please give me some time, give me a little bit more time and I'll pay you back. Which he probably could have imagined. But he refused. He was unyielding. He wouldn't even give his colleague additional time. But he threw him into prison. The model of living in community that the king had demonstrated by his overwhelming grace, born out of the act of forgiveness, was lost on the servant that had owed such a great debt. He wanted to continue living under the rules of the world and insist on having what was his. He offered no grace. He offered no forgiveness. When the rest of the body, the rest of the community, the other servants heard about this, they were understandably shocked. They knew how he had been forgiven, and they saw what he did. When the king found out, he was furious. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you. Living the life of community in Christ is different than living in this crazy world out there. The rules are not the same. We are called to respond with the same grace for one another as we have received from God ourselves. We are called to live, live lives that are marked by a life of forgiveness, seeking to restore back to community those who sin against us. We are not to keep count. 
but to continually pour out grace on those who seek to turn from their sins and to reconcile with us. Is that the way of the world? No. But we are called to live under the rules of the kingdom of God as we seek to separate ourselves from living the vita loca, the crazy life, and to begin living the vita 